In the 1980s, this fashion company was one of the most popular. Today, it's embroiled in scandal, close to irrelevant, and worst of all, mixed up in murder. On the 1st of August, 2017, near the Chibut River in Argentina, a dead body was found. The subject, Santiago Maldonado. This is where divers found the body of activist Santiago Maldonado. His cause of death, asphyxia and hypothermia, meaning he drowned, or maybe was drowned. They're asking why the body was found in an area police had already searched. Santiago was an Argentine activist, which on its own isn't significant. What is significant is what he was demonstrating against. In the 1980s and 1990s, Benetton was an iconic brand. It was famous, or sometimes infamous, for raising awareness for social issues around the world. Long before Nike embraced social activism as a brand strategy, Benetton essentially invented it. In fact, Benetton was the first brand that wasn't an automobile company to build and race in the Formula One, inspiring Red Bull to do the same shortly afterwards. So how does an iconic brand like Benetton, known for raising social awareness, find itself in the midst of scandals and ultimately becoming irrelevant? And this is the story of the rise and fall of the Benetton Group. The 80s was a bad time for race relations. There was the new crossroad fire in London, the crack epidemic in the US, the apartheid in South Africa. I'm not prepared to talk to people who want a revolutionary change. And even the Cold War. But despite the bad times, one brand was having a really good time. Runaway success in the fashion industry is one way to describe the sensation caused by the Italian Benetton firm. Benetton wasn't just a fashion brand. It wasn't just selling sweaters. It was the voice of the youth. The brand was using its platform to pierce through social discourse, and it was working. In the 1980s, Benetton was a cultural phenomenon. The Benetton family was a European embodiment of the American dream. A true rags to riches story, beginning with the vision of one young man from Trevesio, Italy. At the age of 14, Luciano Benetton took up a job at a clothing store. His father's premature death, his mother's heart condition, meant that both he and his 11-year-old sister, Juliana, had to start working. Over the next few years, Luciano grew into a seasoned sales clerk at Della Siega, a local clothing store. European clothing stores in the 1950s weren't like they are today. Customers were separated from sales clerks by a long wooden counter, and the clothes were hidden away. Customers would describe what they're looking for, and the sales clerk would find something suitable. Luciano had already started to dream of a different kind of store. A store that represented post-war freedom, where teenagers could roam around without their parents and experience clothing. A store with bright colors, stylish clothing, all at a reasonable price. A store for discovery, where customers didn't even know what they wanted yet. This idea came to reality when Luciano teamed up with his sister to start producing and selling bright, colorful sweaters. Within four months, Luciano was able to sell 20 sweaters a week. They called the brand Très Joli. The brand grew quickly. More and more stores were holding their stock, but by 1965, Luciano decided to change strategies. They needed to control the customer experience, so they decided to set up stores that only carried their product. The brand was renamed United Colors of Benetton. The genius behind Benetton's early growth was the franchise model. Benetton decided that instead of spending capital in building their own store locations, they would partner with individuals who had the capital and the right attitude to set up Benetton stores. Benetton did not require any royalties nor any stake in the partner's business. The only requirement was that the franchise abide by the strict rules on how to operate the stores and hold exclusively Benetton stock. Benetton stores were small but vibrant. Each store had floor-to-ceiling shelves that housed colorful sweaters that they became renowned for. And each store, while in line with Benetton's strict brand guidelines, had a local feeling that appealed to the neighborhood that it was part of. By 1975, Benetton had over 200 stores, each stocking slightly different merchandise that reflected the current mood of the neighborhood. This allowed Benetton to diversify its styles and hedge against any downside risk if one color or style was a complete flop. 
Benetton pioneered fast production processes. Inspired by the Japanese Kanban approach, they started dyeing finished garments instead of yarn. This allowed them to swap colors at the last moment. A normal fulfillment time for Benetton from an order request was just about 10 days. Benetton also embraced technology. They had more computer operators than factory workers in most of their facilities. The brand was getting daily readings from sales for each of its stores and making production decisions based on those readings. As a result, they were able to maintain little to no inventory and reacting rapidly to changes in consumer demand. By the 1980s, Benetton had reached a status of global sensation. Everyone from Princess Caroline of Monaco to Princess Diana of Wales was wearing it. The era of Tuscany and Benetton represented the best and most controversial times for the brand. I don't give a damn about consensus. They like it, great. They don't like it, what can I do? Tuscani was not like other photographers at the time. He was a pioneer of captioning pertinent but taboo topics of the moment. From AIDS epidemic to Israel-Palestine to the LGBTQ, if it was relevant and controversial, he was covering it. Creator and photographer Oliviero Toscani is trying to show how ordinary Jews and Palestinians who live and work together can knock down the barriers of hatred and religious and racial differences. The sweaters would sell regardless, said Toscani, so we had to use our relevance to talk about the important issues of the moment. When Gorbachev visited Paris in the mid-1980s, he saw an ad of two kids kissing, one holding the US flag and the other a Soviet one. Gorbachev leaned over to his assistant and asked, who is this Benetton anyway? Benetton stores began popping up everywhere. Perhaps one of the most memorable ones was in Prague, while Czechoslovakia was still part of the USSR, or perhaps the one in Baghdad. On its opening day, a lady bought 150 sweaters from Benetton. It later turned out that she was the wife of Saddam Hussein. Toscani was at the helm of Benetton's groundbreaking campaigns in the 1990s. The clothes took a back seat. By the early 90s, a strategy that was considered pioneering and provocative soon turned distasteful. I think it's gone on even further than the, than the baby advertisement. I think that Benetton are attempting yet again to, to develop a very positive image um, about AIDS in this particular ad but they've lost track of, of, of public taste in, in, in this one. Most famously, the campaign that used the killing of Benedetto Grado in Palermo was extremely controversial and really ill-received. How does my father's death enter into the publicity for sweaters, said his daughter. There are important questions to be asked of Benetton on whether their marketing strategy was genuinely culture shifting or whether it was just leveraging on the shock factor to gain attention. As time passed, more people began to feel that Benetton had gone too far. Benetton is essentially taking convicted killers, some of the worst murderers in America, and glorifying and romanticizing them and turning them into poster boys. And once the tides had turned, the bad press kept coming. There has been another horrific incident at a garment factory in Bangladesh. An eight-story building collapsed today, killing at least 145 people. Rana Plaza was one of the most devastating incidents in modern fashion history. The eight-story building was built in 2006 without any proper permits. On the 23rd of April, many of the floors were closed off due to large cracks in the building. But the factory owners of the upper floors ignored the warnings and forced their workers to return to work. On the 24th of April, the building collapsed, killing 1,134 people. 38 people were charged with murder, including the owner of the building, Suhail Rana. Rana was later arrested after a four-day manhunt while trying to flee into India. He pleaded not guilty, and the trials continue to this day. Benetton was one of the brands that manufactured in Rana Plaza. However, the brand initially denied this in a public tweet. Later, as the authorities dug through the rubble to recover bodies, Benetton labels were found. Benetton changed its stance on this tragic incident and accepted some level of responsibility. In the press release, the group pledged to $1.6 million to the victims of the families. Coming back full circle where we started, 
the death of Santiago Maldonado. Santiago was an activist. He was fighting for the rights of the native Argentinian population to recover their lost land. It's important to highlight, though, that the rights to the land are not so straightforward. From 11,000 BCE, the Mapuche people have lived in Patagonia. However, from 1878 through 1885, the Argentine state seized those lands intending to expand their territory for agriculture. 15,000 indigenous people were expelled from their land. This conquest was called the Conquest of the Desert, an ironic name for a land that was both fertile and populated. It was underwritten by the British funds and Argentine troops were armed with British rifles. The majority of the land conquered was awarded to the Argentine Southern Land Company, CSTA, which was registered in 1889 in, you guessed it, London. In 1991, CSTA was sold to the Edzioni Company, which, as we know, was controlled by the Benetton family. The ownership of this land was disputed in court for several years, and ultimately, it was ruled that the land belonged to CSTA and therefore the Benetton family. The judge who ruled in favor of the Benettons was married to Gladys Carla Rossi, who coincidentally happened to run the Italian consulate in Esquel, in the Chibut province, which was the area that controlled the land in the first place. Whether it's just a coincidence or whether there's something greater at play is to be determined. But the death of Santiago was ultimately ruled an accident. He allegedly drowned due to his inability to swim, and the police who were chasing the activists out of the indigenous land supposedly had nothing to do with his death. But a lot of people dispute this story. Luciano Benetton and his family have throughout the years put forward what they believe to be the right steps. However, there have been numerous missteps that have eroded the trust of the Benetton group built over decades. From their not-so-tasteful advertisement campaigns to the tragic events of the Rana Plaza, the Mapuche people, the death of Santiago Maldonado, whilst once known for accurately reading the mood of the moment, in the new millennium, they've really misread it. 